Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our live broadcast tonight. My name is Apostle Joseph Helen, and I'm coming to you live from Nairobi, Kenya, the city in the sun, the beautiful city. I keep telling you that you need to pay us a visit. Come to Nairobi one of these fine days, then you'll find wonderful people, intelligent people, hardworking people, inquisitive people. Sometimes a bit on the skeptical side, but that's fine. It's better to be that way than to be nothing at all. Glory to God. I thank God so much for having you with us tonight. It's Saturday and we're going to be answering your questions. It is question and answer. I call it wisdom for life. Glory to God. So, are you ready for wisdom for life? Yeah? Answers to pertinent questions. So I'm ready to answer your questions based on the Holy Word of God. The Bible says that all wisdom and knowledge is found in Christ Jesus. Colossians 2 verse 3. In him are found all the treasures of wisdom and academic knowledge or scientific knowledge. And if you look at the book of Daniel chapter 1 verse 4, the Bible talks about Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego, the four Hebrew sons, as those whose wisdom could not be matched by the magicians and the soothsayers and the prognosticators of the days of the king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. And the spirit of God that operated in them is the spirit that operates in us this time, except that we have a better covenant because Jesus died already. So the middle wall of partition that separated us from the things of God has been removed. And now we can access the throne of glory and we can enjoy and appropriate the great things that God has in store for his children, especially those that understand his word and those that understand the present day truth, the revealed word of God. So I'll be so thrilled and so happy to answer all your questions tonight. I would like you to know that you're special, significant and important to us. That's why we come to you every single day. Glory to God. All right, so let me see who we have online. Let's see who we have online. I have Patrice Ajuang Otieno saying, lucky for me today. I'm catching you live and clear. Thank you so much. So happy to have you with us. Our wonderful, beautiful daughter, Chumba Tash. She says, missing you my people. We miss you too. Yeah, I was looking forward to seeing you yesterday. Yeah, um, I thought you were going to come over yesterday, my dear. But it's all right. You're blessed. Everything you do is blessed in Jesus' name. Quira Dennis, he says, the moment to get questions answered, blessings upon blessings. Thank you so much for those blessings. I'm just so blessed to have you in my life. You're such an amazing fellow. I couldn't talk to you on the phone. Was it yesterday? It was so busy, you know. The entire day was just packed with activities. Today has been busy as well, but we, we can talk on WhatsApp, okay? Mr. Dennis, an amazing man. Lesan Kiplagat. He says, be the change. Wonderful, that's right. We've got to be the change. We shouldn't ask government to do the changing. You do the changing from the area of your jurisdiction. And then like a domino effect, it will just reflect all around you. Hallelujah. Daisy Kwinga, wonderful daughter. I love you so much. So happy to have you with us. Glory to God. So I'm waiting for your questions. Um, so happy to uh, minister to you tonight. Glory to God. I'm blessed to have my people with me. Mr. Nzomo is, uh, as usual, doing his genius things with the softwares and with the cameras with the sound, with the, all those things that, you know, you don't get to see. It's quite some work. It takes hours on end to get these things done. You know, just putting graphics on the screen, for example, takes quite some time, you know. And getting to see me nice and clear, to hear me clearly, takes quite some engineering. So I thank God for him. He does a great job. And then, of course, I have my beautiful wife. She's somewhere praying. I'd love to have her online, you know, and on set with me. But 
so night she decided to sit somewhere. She has a big smile where she's seated and she's just praying for me and that's just so wonderful. Then our two beautiful babies, they're also somewhere with mommy. And these guys pray, you know, eight year old and five year old, but they have already learned how to pray. They pray in tongues, they pray in the spirit, they know the word of God. We are raising them in the ways of the Lord and they love it. It's just so beautiful. My mom, my biological mom is also somewhere, not far from me here, praying. We are people given to prayer and we pray in tongues a lot and we pray in tongues all the time. Glory to God. So Mr. Nzomo, yes. let's see, uh, can, is it possible to just work on the, just fine tune a little bit? On the... Yeah. Just fine tune the picture just a bit, unless it's my laptop that's receiving me, it this way. A bit blurry, yeah? Let me see. How is it on your end? Let me see and then let you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm waiting for your questions. This has been a wonderful week. We have learned some amazing things from Monday to Tuesday. On Tuesday, we were learning about uh, Dokimazo, the discernment as a prophetic code. Discernment, scrutinizing things, examining things, you know, questioning things, and knowing what the Lord wants you to know based on scrutiny. And on Wednesday was our 19th wedding anniversary. So we are still celebrating our 19th wedding anniversary. My wife and I have been married for the last 19 years. We got married when we were very young. But even then, we had a six year courtship. But we still got married when we were extremely young. So now we're enjoying a beautiful wedding anniversary. 19 years. And we're going to celebrate it all the way up to end of this year. Okay, so thank you so much for praying for us, for being there, for being part of our family, and for being a great encouragement to us. You know, any moment you mention our names before God, we feel the power, we feel the anointing. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful. You know, you begin to pray, I can trace that prayer all the way to where you're doing it. Completely the time you're doing it. When you guys pray for us, I can sense it straight away. The moment you begin to pray like this, I feel it, you know, the angels just increase and the power of God just multiplies around my life. So it's so beautiful when you guys pray. So thank you so much. Continue praying for us. And specifically, the Bible says, pray for us so that we may declare the word of God boldly as we ought, so that we may make plain the mysteries of the gospel of Jesus. Pray for us so that we are delivered from wicked and unreasonable people, those who don't fear God. Remember in the Bible, there was a time when Herod took James and killed him. James was the pillar of the New Testament church. He was the one in charge of the New Testament church. And Herod got him and killed him. And they wondered, how could they kill the leader of the apostles? And then he promptly arrested Peter as well. And he was waiting for end of Passover so that he could kill Peter. And the church woke up and the church began to pray. And as they prayed, I tell you, an angel appeared in prison and released Peter out of prison. And a little girl called Rhoda heard the voice of Peter as he was knocking at the door. At the place where people were praying for him, the church woke up and began to pray and Peter was released. So for us to continue ministering to you and blessing you, you need to pray for us because it's actually possible for the wicked people to prevail against the church if the church doesn't pray. So we need to pray. So it's important for you to pray for us. I pray for you all the time, every single day, including today, I've prayed for you already. So make a point to pray for us as well. I can see Franz Webber online. He says, amen, good evening, a blessed evening to you, my son. You know, one thing I like about you, Franz, you are consistent and loyal. Those are qualities of successful people. Yeah, I see my wonderful people like Daisy Quinga, consistent and loyal. You know, Dennis Quira, consistent. They're always there. And these are the people that will reap the benefits and the fruits that come out of the seed of the word that we plant in your spirits. So consistency is very important in anything that you'd like to achieve in life. If you want to be a great business person, be consistent with the work that you do. You know, consistency and persistence beats talent.
People who are consistent and persistent beat talented people any time. You may find a brilliant fellow. They know their craft. They know their subject well. They know their trade really well. And then there's someone else who doesn't know as much. They know just a little bit. Maybe not much of training or education or skills, but they have this element of persistence. They never give up. Such people always beat talented people anytime. So I pray that you will continue to manifest qualities of consistency, consistency, longevity. You know, when I was in high school, they used to call it stickability. Just stick there. And when I started playing jazz, in the jazz fraternity, they would call it stick to itiveness. You know, just stick to it. Glory to God. And when you do, you'll always find yourself succeeding against all odds. Glory to God. So I'm ready for your questions. And I'll be so happy to answer every single one of them with precision because the Spirit of God gives us precision. The Spirit of God gives us wisdom. There's no question you'll ask whose answer we will not have. We have answers to every single question. Why? Because the Bible contains God's wisdom. And there's nothing that beats God's wisdom. If it is about finances, we will answer you. If it's about marriage, relationships, family, we'll answer you. If it's about your physical health, we will answer you. If it is about any aspect of your faith, or your spiritual development, we will answer you as well because the Word of God contains the answers. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. And of course, we're also approaching Christmas and uh, it's just so wonderful to, uh, to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Of course, he was not born on the 25th of December, but that doesn't matter. What matters is the celebration, the remembrance. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Taking the body and the blood of Jesus, we do that remembering him. We don't do it on the exact day, you know, he was crucified. Was it the 14th of the month of Nisan or something like that? I need to do a bit more research on that. Yeah, there was a specific date Jesus was crucified. But we don't celebrate his crucifixion on that particular day. We celebrate his crucifixion and his resurrection daily as we take Holy Communion. So his birth as well is not something that is cast in a particular day or a particular month yeah but since people work and people have different responsibilities and it's just convenient that we all celebrate on the 25th so we go for it so I would like to start by wishing wishing you a Merry Christmas you know rejoice during this holiday season the Bible says in his presence is fullness of joy at his right hand their pleasures forevermore enjoy yourself most Christians are used to being miserable you know, they think we need to be serious and, and we need to have a thick set on our foreheads and we need to look like we've just taken some lemons, you know. God wants you to be joyful and happy, so celebrate, eat some food. This is not the month of fasting, this is the month of feasting, okay. The Bible is a wash and replete with feasts. Each of them meant people were to eat, celebrating God and thanking Him for the harvest. For example, Pentecost was a feast for the harvest. People celebrated the harvest. That's what Pentecost was all about. This was the Feast of Sukkoth when they celebrated the Israelites living in tents. You know, there's the Feast of the Trumpets and many other feasts that you have in the Old Testament. So God loves it when His people celebrate when they enjoy themselves. It's not sinful to be happy to dance and to celebrate God. Earlier today, with our music director, we were doing some music, some Christmas carols for a few of our friends. And they, they were so happy dancing and celebrating and eating and drinking and enjoying themselves. And it was just so wonderful being there. Okay, I can see your questions coming in. Franz Weber says, what should I do if I'm in fasting? and angering circumstances arise. Trying to avoid them as much as I can, but they're, they're busy touching me. Now, I want to tell you something. When you're fasting, your sugar levels are low. When your sugar levels are low, your dopamine is low. Oxytocin is low, okay? In endocrinology, the study of the endocrine system of a human being, that system that enables you to relate to people based on happiness, sadness, and all those other, emotions when you haven't eaten your sugar levels go down 
to that extent you are not going to be that happy all right you need a certain amount of sugar in your body for you to be happy you need a certain amount of food in your body for your dopamine levels to go up so that you can relate to people in a way that is rich and fulfilling and you also need your oxytocin because oxytocin helps with killing pain so that you're not easily angered people are easily angered when they're sensitive to pain but when you have oxytocin you find yourself not that sensitive to pain so you can persevere for example a person who is in love sees everything good they wake up in the morning and everything is okay you try to frustrate them they just love because somebody loves them that's why it's so important to love people when you love someone their oxytocin in their blood goes up so that even if things are difficult and circumstances are dire they don't feel the pain because oxytocin is a pain killer now when you fast oxytocin goes down dopamine goes down all the hormones that are supposed to make you happy are not found in your blood anymore for that reason a fasting person is easily irritated you are highly irritable that's the reason why you need to exercise the highest level of self control now self control is a is a fruit of your human spirit if you read the book of galatians chapter 5 verse 9 verse 22 going all the way to 24 it talks about the fruit of the, the spirit being love joy peace and all that please go read it and those are fruits you produce out of your own spirit but your spirit is influenced and affected by the state of your body so if you're feeling tired and you're feeling hungry and you have not slept well you will find yourself snapping at people easily angered you are volatile you hit the roof much faster it doesn't mean that anything is wrong with you it simply means the sugar level the sugar level in your blood strip is low when you break the fast you'll find yourself in entering into the joy camp again but as a child of god you can still choose to produce the fruit of the spirit which is joy kindness long suffering patience faithfulness all those things goodness you can still produce them even when you feel irritated that's where self control comes in control that irritation control that anger and be good anyway this happens even if somebody's just physically tired you've been working the whole day and somebody tries to crack a joke on your way home and you say what is there to laugh about because you just want to rest at that moment you don't want humor but you can control yourself and still laugh anyway but the best way to handle it is to actually tell the people around you tell them that i'm fasting for that reason if you find me a bit on the irritable side please bear with me tell them i've worked the whole day and i'm feeling physically tired i need some rest so when you talk to me and you find i'm not as humorous as i usually am please bear with me and understand me explain to the people the circumstances that prevail at any given moment when you do that you will be more sociable your faith is not going to be the reason why you're snapping at people and getting angry at people and then they start wondering okay what well, if fasting is supposed to help you why are you so angry because most people don't see the connection between the spiritual and the physical what you eat affects your spirit what you read affects your spirit and your physical body what you eat affects your physical body and your spiritual existence and if you're not eating it affects your body your body gets physically weak but your spirit gets very strong and very sensitive your spirit will sense signals from around from electromagnetic signals to physical signals to uh, signals that have to do with pictures and sounds and feelings you become sensitive for that reason you need to learn and practice self control so friends that's how you handle it okay there's nothing wrong with you when you feel irritable but you can control your responses to the people or the circumstances that irritate you that's what we call self control a fruit of the spirit found in the book of galatians chapter 5 and from verse 22 okay and the bible says against love there is no law there's no law against the fruit of the spirit there's no community there's no generation uh, there is no persuasion religious or otherwise that's contrary to love everybody wants to be loved and love is a choice that you make and you produce the fruit of love from your spirit irrespective of what goes on around you that yeah, that's a good one 
Flora, my dear, how are you doing? God bless you. So happy to see you. Hallelujah. She says, consistency and persistence beats talent. Wow. Thank you for this. Stick ability, stick to itiveness. Yes, that's right. Stick to it, it will work. Do you know, this live broadcast, ladies and gentlemen, do you, rem do you remember in May, that is what, six months ago? Yeah, when we started this broadcast, we had 1,900 followers. Six months later, we have 40,900 followers. Do you see? Just sticking to it. Every single day we come to you. It's only in rare occasions that we've missed our live broadcast. Very rare occasions. But I tell you, 99.99% of the times we've been online. It is sticking to it that makes things successful. Of course, as fast people will ignore you. After that, they will belittle you, you know. Uh, they will ridicule you. So first you're ignored, second you're ridiculed, third they fight you, fourth you win. <laughs> Did you get that? When you start anything new, be it a business, ministry, a new song, a new painting, you move house, any new thing you do, you buy a new phone, whatever new thing you do, you wear a new suit, you change your hairstyle, whatever. The first thing people do the very first thing they do, they ignore you. Yeah, they look at you and say, ah, oh, forget about this fellow. They are going nowhere. Yeah. And then when they realize that you're not giving up, they ridicule you. So that you feel embarrassed, so that you feel like you're the only one acting that way, so that you stop it altogether. When they realize you're not stopping, they fight you. They just come out fighting you. And if you still don't quit, because it's impossible to defeat anyone in their purpose. Let me tell you that early. If a person is operating in their purpose, it doesn't matter how much you fight them, you'll never defeat them. In fact, the people who fight others are the ones who are out of purpose. They're out of joint. If you're really out of purpose, how do you expect to succeed? So if you're fighting anyone, if you go against anybody who is in their purpose, the nurse is doing the job the way they were trained to do it. And you start fighting that nurse, you will lose and the nurse will win. If a man of God or a woman of God is doing their job the way God called them to do it, and you start fighting them, you will lose and they'll win. It doesn't matter how tightly knit your conspiracy is. You will lose and they win. So first, they ignore you. Second, they ridicule you to make you feel embarrassed. And if that doesn't work, they will fight you. And you remember, I've just told you, they will not succeed if you're in your purpose. And having fought you, the last thing that happens is that you win and they'll join you. Those who fought you will say, oh, you know, we prayed for you. We knew God was with you all along. You were just trying to test to see if you're really serious about this thing. But all oh, from the beginning, we just knew God was with you. So don't worry about how we fought you. Do you remember the sons of Jacob telling Joseph? Actually, they lied to him. They said before our father died, he came and spoke to us. And he told us to talk to you. And to tell you that you shouldn't punish us for having tortured you, for having beaten you up, for having cast you into the pit, and for having sold you to the Ishmaelites and the Midianites, and for having been so mean to you. He said you should not take those things to heart and you should forgive us. They lied. You know what Joseph did? He said, if, if you read Genesis, he says that the devil intended this for evil, but God intended it for good to save many more people alive as it is this day. So when people fight you and people go contrary to you, the devil tries to use that for evil, but God will use the very same thing to work together for your good. All things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8 verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Those things that have come your way are working together for your good. Nothing can destroy you if you're in your purpose. If you know you're doing what God has called nothing destroys you. If you know you're called as a wife and you're being a good wife to your husband, there's no war that will ever defeat you. If you know you're a husband and you've been called into the life of a woman and you're doing your level best, I did say perfectly, I said just being in your purpose, nothing and no one can ever defeat you. Glory to God, isn't that so wonderful? So your biggest defense when it comes to war is just stick to your purpose. Glory to God. 
I can see Darius Fabio Valle says, hello, pastor. It will be great honor to meet you. I'm facing so many setback problems anytime. Good things about to come my way. Something can come in the way to spoil it. Please, how can I contact you? My contacts are on my Facebook page. So go ahead and WhatsApp me. Yeah, if you WhatsApp me, I'll respond. I always respond to everybody, okay? So Darius, first thing I need to tell you is that God has called you into the prophetic. You've been called to minister in the prophetic. Not necessarily standing in front of the child to prophesy, but you're the kind of a guy can see you dream dreams and you see things and those things come to pass. And this is one of the reasons the devil has been fighting you. The devil never fights empty vessels. If you find the devil fighting you and things getting difficult in your life, ladies and gentlemen, it means there's something spectacular about you. Most people think, what's wrong with me? Everything I try just goes wrong. I buy a car, I get an accident. I buy a phone, the screen cracks. What's wrong with me? Uh -uh. Those are signs there's something significantly spectacular and special and phenomenal about you. For that reason, you need to be given to the word of God, which is the wisdom that will enable you to fulfill your purpose and to win the wars you're supposed to win. So the reason why things have not gone the right way in your life, Darius, is because you are called in the prophetic. You have a powerful tongue. When you speak things, they come to pass. I can see you. I can see that. I can see the angels of prophecy around you, but you didn't even know that you had that gift. Now that I've spoken it, it's activated in you. Now get interested in the word of God. And as I'm speaking right now, things are moving in the right direction for you. Glory to Jesus. Things are moving in the right direction for you right now. I can see all the challenges and setbacks and retrogressive acts of the enemy against your life are cancelled and removed in the mighty name of Jesus. And things are beginning to move in the right direction for you. And I'm seeing especially in the area of finances, I can see the works of your hands are now going to start bringing you money. And you'll be able to afford the things you need to afford and to meet your obligations, your financial obligations. So everything is going to move perfectly well for you. I can see you wanted to study something and something happened and you're not able to finish it. I can see God giving you grace to finish that whatever it is that you wanted to study. The many plans you have, you, 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 you are a good thinker, you plan ahead. And uh, more often than not, you don't know what to do after you have planned. But this particular moment, because you're connected during this broadcast, the angels that work with me are working in your life right now, and you will find yourself making it. It's not going to be sudden. It's going to be step by step. I prefer it when it happens slowly but surely, rather than suddenly having all the blessings coming your way, and then it finds you unprepared. And then a blessing turns into a curse. All right? So you're blessed, Darius. And then keep watching us so that you learn more wisdom of the word of God. Fran says, what is the meaning of a hole in a spiritual realm? That, uh, I think that should be a, a tool for digging. All right? I dreamed of a hole of my cousin drawing a straight line. And the line started being crooked. Dark shadows were surrounding her. Her sister then tried to help her, but at the end she got irritated and left her. Hmm. I had to step in and try to fix the hole, which now looked bent. Any tool that is used for doing work stands for spiritual power. So when you take, for example, in the Bible, we are told about an axe and that Israel had been made like an axe. And if you read the book of Matthew chapter 3, the Bible talks about the axe now being at the foot of the tree. So an axe is a weapon in the hands of God for cutting down any branch that does not bear fruit. A hoe on the other side is supposed to be a weapon that removes those things that compete against the actual plant that you want to take care of. Because a hoe is used for weeding. It's used for taking away weeds. For that reason, in the spiritual realm, weeds or tares stand for the planting of the devil. Remember the parable that Jesus gave of the tares. That somebody went and planted weed, and then tares also grew with the weed. And then they asked, should we uproot the tares? And the master said, no, let them mature, because during maturity you can tell the difference. Those tares and wheat look exactly alike. Because if you try to uproot tares, you may end up inadvertently uprooting the wheat as well. 
So Jesus gave them wisdom and said, let them just grow together. And during harvest, you can separate them. So tares are the plantings of the enemy, things the enemy plants against God's children. For that reason, a hoe stands for the power to deliver God's people from the planting of the enemy. The Bible says those who are planted in the house of the Lord will grow without end. Psalm 92 from verse 10 going on to 12. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord will grow without end. But the planting of the enemy, it shall crumble. It cannot stand. Okay? So that's what the whole stands for. And the crookedness you saw is, of course, the enemy is the one that makes things crooked. The Bible says um, that every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked straight and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh will see it together. That's what the scripture says. So crookedness comes from the devil. Okay. Glory to God. That's found in the book of Isaiah chapter 40. Okay. It says in the, from verse 4, Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places shall be made plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Okay? Isaiah chapter 40, verse 4 to 5. So that's the crookedness you're seeing. But all crooked things are straightened as you speak the word of God and as you speak in tongues. Glory to Jesus. Apelles says, Good evening, Apostle. I've heard people say that when one gets an itch on their palm of their left hand, that money is coming. <laughs> what does the itch mean? <laughs> an itch means there's acid in that part of your body, and the body is trying to get rid of that acid. <laughs> Glory to God. If there is acid on your skin, you will feel itchy and you'll scratch it so that it breaks out and the acid comes out of your body. <laughs> All right? So, <laughs> you know, inflammation causes itching. So if a part of your body is inflamed, before it becomes painful, it's fast itchy. And if you scratch it for a while, it becomes sore. So there is no truth to that assertion that if there's an itch on your left palm you will get money how do people get money you get money when you consistently solve problems find out where problems are and don't be part of the problem when you find a problem and you solve that problem you will attract money to yourself and if you want money to come your way consistently solve that problem consistently you may say, but man of God, I've been solving problems for the last six months and no one is noticing me. Listen, somebody's noticing. Because the Bible says that if you curse a king in your bedroom, that a bird of the night will go and report it to the king. The Bible says that the, 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 your walls, the, the wood that makes your wall will report to the rafters of your roof. The very things that you do secretly and no one is watching and it becomes public knowledge. So, if you solve problems consistently, even if the right people have not yet seen you, it's only a matter of time before they find you. The idea is this, do not faint. The Bible says if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. The Bible says God renews your youth like that of an eagle, that if even the, the, the faint will get their strength renewed. He rejuvenates you and revitalizes you. Romans 8 verse 10 says that if the Spirit of God dwells in you, that even if your body is dead because of sin, the Spirit of God will give it life because of righteousness. And verse 11 of Romans 8 says that if the Spirit that raised Christ victorious alive in you, that same Spirit will revitalize, will give life to your mortal body. So it's possible for you to be revitalized when things are difficult. Just don't give up. So what helps any person to make money is when they solve problems consistently. Now, if you solve problems skillfully, you make a bit more. If your skills are higher than others, you make even much more. So for you to make more money, please invest in your skills, your problem, problem solving skills. Invest in your problem solving skills. And having invested in that, improve your skills so that you're more efficient. Okay, more intelligent, more efficient, more knowledgeable. The higher your level of knowledge, the more money you will make. That's how it goes. 
So the itch of the palm is acidity or inflammation. <laughs> of course, there are people in the spiritual realm, especially based on tradition, who have their own interpretations of such things. But ladies and gentlemen, to make money, you just need to be a problem solver who solves problems consistently and who solves problems skillfully. And if your skills are wanting, please improve them through practice, through study, through mentorship, apprenticeship. Get somebody that can teach you. And when they teach you, please listen to them. Don't try telling them what to do when they are better than you. Fools tend to correct people who are better than them. Yeah, A wise person learns from a person who is better than them. All right, blessings, my dear. Hallelujah. Uh, Francis, the feed is still blurry, is it? Mr. Nzomi, just have a look and yeah, see. It's okay. It's, it's fine, yeah? It's okay. Okay, Mr. Franz, please, um, I think you need to uh, maybe reboot your contraption, your device. Uh, if it is your laptop, then just, just reboot, okay? Then you'll find the feed pixel clear. Glory to God. Joy Muniva. She says, how are you doing, my dear? Bless you in Jesus' name. She says, I dreamed that I had traveled to Mombasa. That is a, a coastal city in Kenya. Um, so, so she says, I dreamed that I had traveled to Mombasa with my son. And when we were in the car ready to travel back, I sent him to buy something. But he didn't come back. Like he got lost. And I kept looking for him. What does that mean? The devil is trying to bring fear into your life. Your child will not get lost in the mighty name of Jesus. When the devil wants to attack you, he does something called mental and spiritual suggestion. It's something media people use. When media people want you to buy something, they suggest it to you through what we call TV commercials or jingles. These are advertisements on TV and on radio. They can do that for six straight months. They keep telling you, buy this particular thing. So if, for example, maybe I want to sell, let's say I've manufactured a contraption, something that helps you um, measure temperature in a better way than the thermometer. So to sell it to you, oh, I think that's a bit too complicated. Let's talk about food. So I like drinking coconut water because of its health benefits. Now, I always have a glass in the morning and a glass in the evening. And coconut water balances the electrolytes in your body and you become well balanced. Yeah, please look it up. Coconut water and health benefits. Just go to Google and look it up. You'll be amazed at how God has given us medicines, things that will help you get rid of sickness and disease. So I like drinking coconut water. My family does that as well. And it enables us to remain healthy and strong. Now, if I want to commercialize coconut water, I want to monetize the whole thing. One of the things I must do is make mental suggestions to you using pictures and using experiences. So I'll get people drinking coconut water looking very happy and looking healthy, especially if you can get a couple, yeah, a young couple, and then they have two children, boy and girl, preferably, and they all drink coconut water and you can see their eyes sparkling and you can see them so happy and the wife has her hair, you know, flowing in the wind, you know and the, the husband is there holding their wife's hand and they're running uh, along the beach and the kids are so happy and they're playing with the sand and then later they go to sit in a restaurant with a gazebo or something of that sort or a parasol above them and then they take a sip of coconut water and they say coconut water the elixir of life so i can make that suggestion for six months but the seventh month, when you see it on the shelf, you will buy it. You see, that's how marketing happens. Mental suggestion, using sounds and pictures and experiences. That's how it's done. So when the devil wants to do something in your life, he uses the same marketing gimmick. He suggests this to you in a dream so that you can fear. The moment you fear like this, the devil doesn't have to do anything anymore. Because fear attracts everything that's negative. But if you say, I cancel it in Jesus' name, it will never affect you. So my dear Joy, we cancel that in the name of Jesus. But traveling to the coastal city is a beautiful thing. People need holidays, especially during this festive season. When we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, you know, the cradle of the Christian faith. So going to the coast and to enjoy the beaches and places that are beautiful, that's fine. 
but a child getting lost that satanic mental and spiritual suggestion to introduce fear in your life and that fear is what will cause the whole thing to come to pass. The devil cannot do anything in your life without your participation or without your leave, without your authority, without your permission. You can deny him in the mighty name of Jesus. Okay. All right, Dennis asks, what role does the Old Testament law play in the life of a believer today? The, uh, the, the Old Testament is what has been revealed in the New Testament. So it plays a major role. The Old Testament was God's heart, God's desire, God's plan for humanity put on tablets of stone. The New Testament is God's heart, God's desire, God's purpose and plan for humanity written in your heart. You see? So when it's written in your heart, it becomes part and parcel of your life. When it's written on stone, it's apart from you. So you feel obliged to obey it. So if someone isn't watching, you'll not obey it. So the Old Testament is about obedience. The New Testament is about doing. Because the New Testament is already within you. It's a desire within you. When you have a desire to do something, it's much easier to do it than if somebody is forcing you to do it. Or somebody tells you, do this or you'll go to hell. You see, you'll do it out of obligation. For example, giving. If you read the book of 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8, the Bible says that um, God loves a cheerful giver, you know, that everybody should determine from verse 6, everybody should determine what they should give, not out of necessity or, com or compulsion. But everybody should determine in their own heart what they should give because God loves a cheerful giver. And verse 8 says, And God is able to make all grace to abound towards you, so that you having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. So God loves it when you give cheerfully. In the Old Testament, they gave their tithes and their offerings and fast foods and, of, uh, and seed. They gave all those things out of compulsion. It was a must for them to give. And the Bible says God wasn't pleased with them. If you read the book of Hebrews chapter 4, none of them entered God's rest. You see, but now God wants us to do things cheerfully, not out of compulsion or out of necessity, because God loves a cheerful giver. So when the law is written in your heart, you want to follow God cheerfully. You're not under compulsion to do it. You see, the Bible says that the love of God constrains you. When the love is in your heart, you feel the love pushing you to do what you ought to do. But the law will scare you to do what you don't want to do. Do you know there are Christians who don't sin because they're afraid of hell? If you told them that they would not go to hell, they might just as well go and sin. The only thing stopping them from sinning is fear of hell. But God doesn't want us to be like that. God wants us to do what's right because we love him. He doesn't want us to do what's right because we are scared of him. So the, the Old Testament was the letter of the law. First uh, Corinthians chapter 3, the letter, the Bible says the letter kills but the spirit is life. Is it 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians? Let me just look at, look it up quickly. Yeah. Okay, it's 2 Corinthians, not 1. 2 Corinthians 3. It says that the, the um, glory to Jesus. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6 says, Who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, New Covenant? We are able ministers. We are powerful ministers of the New Covenant. Covenant. We are rendered fit and efficient to handle these things. And the Bible says of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. Letter there stands for the law. Grammar. The Hebrew, the Greek word for letter is grammar. Where we get grammar, the English word grammar for letter. The letter in the Bible stands for the law of Moses. The Bible says it's not of the law of Moses, which is the Old Testament, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. You see that? Why does the Spirit give life? Because the Spirit is like you eating food and becoming strong and using that strength to work. The law is like someone else eating food and telling you to be strong. You see, it doesn't work. That as I eat this thing, you get satisfied. It just doesn't work. So the Bible says the law actually could not fulfill the things it was demanding from you. And that's why Jesus took it out of the way, nailed it to the cross. The Bible calls it the handwriting of the law, the letter that was contrary to you. God took it out of the way. Jesus took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Colossians 2 verse 14. He took it out of the way, nailed it to the cross. And verse 15, he made a public display of the devil, 
triumphing over him by the very same cross. The devil loves to use the law because the only way he can catch you is when he uses the law. But we have what we call the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. This time round, God wants you to live life, not just to go obeying things. And you know what? If something is inside you, it's easy to work it out. That's why the Bible says in uh, Philippians 2 verse 13, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In verse 12 it says, it's God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Fear there means reverence, not trepidation. Yeah? Glory to God. So that's what the difference in the law and grace. Grace is something within you. Let me put it in a humorous way. If you eat baked beans and you eat a lot of it, after some time, there will be a compelling force that will send you to the toilet. You will do that. You will go to the toilet. Without being threatened, without being scared, they won't tell you, go to that toilet or I'll send you to hell. Go to that toilet or I deny you your salary. No, your own stomach will tell you you need to go to the toilet. The same happens with the word of God. Now the word of God enters you, the word begins to produce what it talks about and will cause your body to want to do that which the word of God talks about. That's New Testament. In the Old Testament, the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. So in your heart you really feel like killing, but you're afraid that if you kill, you'll be killed. Uh, and yesterday I was reading something about Richard Branson. He's doing something to rehabilitate those that have been uh, uh, taken to jail and things like that. And when they come out of jail, he tries to rehabilitate them, to get them back into the society. A great job. I really celebrate that. And one of the things he said is that, why is it that we kill those who have killed so that we can stop people from killing? He said, why would a death sentence deter people from killing? The person killed, and now you are killing them. How does killing a killer destroys killing? You see? Should we not use another method? And the New Testament is that new method, where it's no longer an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, you know, but grace, things you don't deserve. The Bible says you actually receive double for your sins. How wonderful. Okay, so Dennis, that's what? these two testaments play. It's actually the same testament. Old Testament is New Testament, you know, is the shadow. New Testament is Old Testament revealed. Because Apostle Paul and the rest of the apostles wrote the Bible for us based on the Old Testament. And I want you to know that the Gospels are Old Testament. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the four Gospels are Old Testament because they were written before anyone was saved. The New Testament starts after the book of Acts because the book of Acts shows the acts of those who are saved. So from the book of Acts, you start seeing what the New Testament is, from Romans going onwards. But the New Testament does not start with Matthew because Matthew is still the Old Testament. It was written under the law. Okay. Glory to Jesus. I hope that helps you. Then he says, How can one differentiate between desire, need, and a calling? And can an individual's predefined God's purpose be lost okay desire need and calling first your calling tells on you you look like it you talk like it you act like it you love to do it that's your calling you just love to do it if I give you a computer I will know your calling because I know exactly where you'll go there are things that matter to you if you're watching TV, I will know your calling because I, I'll hear you talking about it. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And your calling is registered in your heart. You'll start saying, oh, I wish you could get some food to feed people. I think I need to get into agriculture. You're talking about your calling. You're an agronomist. Yeah. I think I need to, I, I need to bring better security in this neighborhood. Ah, you see, your calling is talking. Yeah. You start thinking, I need to compose songs for people to sing. Your calling is talking. So your calling is that thing that tells on you. It's really your identity. You're good at it. It's natural in you. Even if you go to study it, as you study it, you understand it much better than anything else. That's your calling. It's natural. It is something you are naturally proficient in. That's your calling. When you begin to operate that thing in the name of Jesus, it becomes supernatural. 
Okay? So that's how you get to know your calling. So what's a desire? A desire is something that's in your heart that you hope to achieve. And a desire is a good thing because the Bible says God gives you the desire of your heart. But that's also Old Testament. Yeah, right now God gives us the pronouncements of our lips, not necessarily the desire of your heart. If you make a pronouncement, if you make a decree, Job 22, 29 says you shall only decree a thing and shall be established unto you. And light will shine upon your path. So you make a declaration, it will happen. You don't just desire, say it out, okay? And need, all right. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, Philippians 4, verse 19. God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So what is it that you need? Need is Old Testament, and need is a sign of immaturity. We don't need anything because the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 21 that all things are yours. All things are yours. All things are yours. All things are yours. Okay? 1 Corinthians 3, 21. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. You actually have no needs. Because all things are already yours. Activate them by speaking them into existence. The same way God spoke the earth into existence. He said, let there be light and there was light. If people need to understand something about the story of creation. Most of you erroneously think that God created the heavens and the earth in seven days. Like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The, uh, or Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And the Bible says a day with God is a thousand years, and a thousand years with God is like one day. So when he said one day, that was a thousand years. Day number two was two thousand years. Day number three is three thousand years. Yeah. Day number four, four thousand years. Day number five, five thousand years. Day number six, six thousand years. Do you know that we are in the six thousand years? That's why Jesus is about to return. This rest is the seven thousandth year. The, the earth as we know it after God renovated it, it's now six thousand years old. We are on the sixth day. Go back to Genesis and see what God did on the sixth day. He created man in his image. This is the time God takes you and changes you. And then the Bible says, at the, the sound of the trumpet, you shall be changed. Okay? And this mortality shall put on immortality. So creation is on the sixth, sixth day or six thousandth year. And then God catches us. The Bible says you'll be caught up. And that being caught up is what people call rapture. Okay, we are towards the end of the age, ladies and gentlemen. So take the gospel of Jesus seriously. Take the word of God seriously. Take your calling seriously. This has nothing to do with perfection. It's got everything to do with progressive growth and development. Glory to Jesus. So can an individual's predefined, can an individual's predefined God's purpose be lost? Yes. If you don't follow the word of God, if you don't follow the manual, as a pilot, you lose your direction. A pilot that does not listen to instructions, a pilot that does not follow the, the manual, does not follow the actual route he was given, will crash. So a child of God who doesn't follow the word of God, doesn't follow their calling and their purpose, can lose the original thing God intended for them. Flora, I'm just about to finish, ladies and gentlemen. Flora says, listening to you for the last six months has really prepared me for my current workstation. Wow. After Corona, I was given a bigger office, a lot more responsibility, bigger challenges, more duties, and I was perfectly prepared. God bless you. I pray for you, your family, and ministry. Now I'm sticking to my purpose. Glory to God. Is that a beautiful testimony? Do you people know we get lots of testimonies? It's only that we don't make a big, a big noise about them because a lot of people like to use testimonies to attract followers. But for us, testimonies are normal. You should have a testimony. You're a child of God. You're full of power. Your life is supernatural. It's not natural. So I'm so thankful to God for you, Flora. My wonderful daughter, bigger office, bigger everything. Glory to God, man. You're sticking to your purpose. I bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. And I give you more and more promotion in the name of Jesus. I always say, anyone who sticks close to me and my wife, it will only be a matter of time before you're a big success. Whether in finances, whether in family, things we are good at. God has called us to reveal the word of God. So you'll start understanding the word of God if you stick close to us. Number two, God has called us 
for family. So you'll start finding your marriage working, your family working, your children, you know, the family thing will come into order, okay? Um, even if you still have issues here and there to deal with. And God has called us into money. So you find yourself rich and prosperous and successful. I've seen even people who don't like me, the fact that they stuck with me for a couple of months caused them to succeed. And then number four, you'll become a worshiper because God has called us into worship, especially the music ministry. Those are the four things we've been called to do. And if you're around us, if you stick close to us, if you hear us over and over again, these things will translate into success for your life. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Friends, what is this light on my right eye when I pray? It lights up and moves away from my eye with my eyes closed. It's like somebody just flashed a light on my right eye. Those things happen to prophetic people. You close your eyes like this and you see purple. A round purple thing inside it is black. It's as if you're seeing your own eyes. <laughs> okay, when you close your eyes. Oh, and then it turns into blue. Sometimes it turns into yellow. Sometimes it turns into green. The colors keep changing. That's now your spirit manifesting the pixels or the spectrum of colors that God wants to use to teach you prophetic things. Okay? So that's the meaning of the light that you keep seeing. And Francis, I was talking with someone on the phone at night, seated on my bed, and eventually I felt a deep sleep and started talking senseless things. But tomorrow, when I wake up, or you mean the next day, the lady I was talking to said, thank you very much for warning me last night. Wow, that's so good. Huh? You saved me. I then asked her, what did I do? She said, I want her, that means you want her, never to eat the food when she reached the funeral. And indeed, they forced her to eat the food, but she refused the food, and the war erupted. But I did not hear myself telling her that. Okay, I need to understand something, Franz. In the spiritual realm, even sound like, ah, can be a whole paragraph or a whole book. Just sound, because God operates using sound codes. Creating meaning out of the sound is what we call interpretation. Spiritual interpretation. You interpret spiritual stuff into natural things for people to understand. So even if what you're speaking were not coherent and they were not making sense, in the spiritual realm they do. And that's why the Bible says when we talk in tongues, our minds are unfruitful but our spirits are speaking mysteries. Okay, that no man understands a person speaking in tongues. You sound incoherent, gibberish. But in the spiritual realm, you're speaking mysteries, okay? So you spoke those mysteries in the mighty name of Jesus, even if they didn't make sense to you. Thank God they made sense to your person. Glory to God. Mike says, I dreamed I was in your home, and I wanted to get water in the fridge. Your son stopped me, and he gave me the water. Then the moment I drank that water, something came out of my mouth like toilet paper. That was just deliverance. Water stands for the word of God, okay? Water stands for the word of God. So you came, um, if you dream you're in my house, you're in the spiritual realm, you're not really in my house. You are engaging me in the spirit and my angels are the ones that you're dealing with and the angels of my son, they're the ones that you're dealing with. And they delivered you. They delivered you from satanic poison, satanic embarrassment, satanic confusion, all right and ridicule those are the things that toilet paper stand for or human waste all right i'm going to finish there thank you so much ladies and gentlemen share this word with your friends and with your family share 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 let as many people as possible enjoy this message now if you don't know jesus your lord and savior please say this prayer for me say lord jesus i believe in you you are the son of god i believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again for my justification and my acquittal. Today, I receive you into my heart as my Lord and Savior. I receive eternal life in my spirit. I thank you that I'm saved, I'm born again. Hallelujah. If you prayed that prayer, you are now a child of God. It's as simple as that. That things of God are simple. And now just make sure that you are given to the word of God, given to prayer, and given to worship, dedicate yourself to the things of God, stick there and it will work for you in the name of Jesus. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll be teaching you about the names of God, a couple of names, not all of them, 
the Bible is full of names of God. I just give you the most common names of God and a little bit of training on angels who will be coming to you at midday tomorrow, East African time. And for the next hour or so, one and a half hours or so, we'll be teaching you about how to worship God using his names. It's part of the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be your name. So we'll be explaining that and giving you greater details there. How to use that for prayer. Hallowed be your name. And how to uh, invoke angelic ministry over your life. So I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Love you so much. Have a wonderful time. Bye-bye.